and we are live. Um, never let it be said that this isn't the type of show that is willing to face um, criticism, pushback, uh, corrections uh, for the records. Um, so today is one of those shows. On a previous show, I actually was in the middle of some long commentary about something. I don't remember what it was, but you know, I'm good at long commentaries on something. So I was talking about it, uh, whatever the it was. And I just threw in there that there's this high school named Diet High School in Chicago that had a group of community activists who did a hunger strike to save the school. And my kind of flippant remark about the, um, the hunger strike was that I didn't understand why black people would uh, put their bodies on the line and threaten harm to themselves to save a government building that had failed them for generations. And the idea that black people would wrap themselves around a school that um, was really honestly kind of not theirs. It's, you know, American public education is a long story of the abuse of black people, not actually um, always the, the dream that we painted out to be. So it was odd to me that Journey for Justice and um, led by uh, a local activist named Jitu Brown um, would stage a hunger strike. I just, I always felt that weird. So that became the punchline for many of my jokes over the years that, you know, you got black people out here threatening to kill themselves for these buildings that, you know, have been uh, miseducating our kids for years. In the middle of saying that, Somebody, I believe it was uh, Deborah Watkins who watches this show says, oh no. <laughs> and Deborah, Deborah Watkins uh, knows a lot of people. She, she's uh, very well connected. So during that show, as I was saying that, she tagged in um, Beulah McLeod, um, who is on our show today and is here to correct the record and set me straight on the story that I told. And, um, and she does so with a little bit of expertise because she happens to be the principal of Walter H. Diet High School in Chicago for the arts that came out of the struggle of the community to keep that building open. And uh, in a previous conversation, what she has said to me is, there's always more context. There's always more things going on that you don't see um, from a distance. So that's what we're talking about today is the context in which I may have missed at the, uh, regarding the community's struggle to keep open this high school in Chicago, Walter H. Diet High School for the Arts, and uh, what came of it. And uh, we'll see where we land. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. How are you, Chris? I'm very well, and I'm excited to have you here because I love context. I love getting sure. to to know the the bigger story, and when we talked privately, you gave me some details. So just let's at the beginning set the basic record straight. Why would the community come out to rally around Walter H. Diet High School in Chicago? Yeah, thank you for having me. So I, first, let me just say I was the founding principal of the school. I'm no longer the principal. I left. Um, last August, now I'm the executive director for an organization, for the Midwest region of an organization called New Leaders, um, which actually trains and develops principals. So now I get to teach people how to do what, what we did there. Um, Diet High School has a rich history and legacy that I think a lot of people are not aware of. It started off as a middle school in the 70s and then became a high school subsequently. And that happened as a result of another school, um, not too many blocks away from Diet called King High School, actually transforming into a selective enrollment high school. And I don't know that your audience may not necessarily be familiar with the structure of schools in Chicago, but there's a very distinct system here. Um, there are neighborhood schools, which Diet, Diet was, there are magnet high magnet schools, which you have to have a certain test score to get into. And then there are selective enrollment schools, which you are very, very competitive. Most of the students in those schools are like in the 99th percentile um, in all testing categories. You have to sit for a test and there are certain requirements that you have to meet. So Diet High School was one of the only neighborhood high schools in the Bronzeville community which um, Bronzeville has a very rich history as well. It's where it's the neighborhood where people migrated and that people say they 
they they migrated, but I say they were fleeing from the South. Black folks were fleeing mm-hmm. from the South <laughs> uh, to find the space of, of sanctuary. And so they, they kind of gravitated to Bronzeville. So you had the arts, you had businesses, you had Provident Hospital, which Diet is actually right across the street from, which is where Daniel Hell Williams performed open heart surgery. I don't know, a lot of people don't know that. This particular community um, is rich with like history and, and a, a huge legacy. So when the time came to close Diet High School, that would have been a critical blow to this neighborhood. Now, mind you, I live in this neighborhood, so I'm integrated into the fabric of the community. That would have been a critical blow because Diet High School is one of the few neighborhood high schools in this area. So for students who just wanted to have the ability or parents who just wanted to have the ability to have their students or children walk to a school that was maybe a block or two away, had Diet closed, that would have been a devastating blow to the options that parents had to offer in this particular space. So unfortunately, and for, you know, fortunately we had, you know, a group of community members who were willing to put their bodies on the line to actually ensure that that did not happen. And that was due to Brown. And that was, and, and to be clear, there were a lot of organizations that rallied around this particular high school. So when you ask me why it was important, like to me, education is one of when you talk about schools you're not just talking about schools you're talking about institutions that actually help to hold the fabric of communities in place we're seeing now that as a result of covid 19 and students not being able to actually physically attend schools a lot of those critical uh, relationships that they have that actually prevent some violence you know are not there so, you know, you know, you see Chicago on the news. I think there's there's a story that's being missed about the impact, right, that schools have in preventing violence. So whether it be providing sus- sustenance to students who are in the community, whether it be serving as a hub for parental involvement and parental education, because when I was the principal of diet, we made sure we actually integrated parents into that into the uh, building and provided courses to help help them become better parents. Whether it be um, partnering with businesses in the community because we did a lot of that. Whether it be providing students with opportunities um, to incorporate themselves in the technological fields, which we actually did. All of those things would not have happened had Diet closed. And so I think the narrative is not, you know, why would why would black people be willing to put their bodies on the line? I think the real question is why do they have to put their bodies on the line, right? To have quality education. I think that needs to become the question that we ask. So one of the things that you mentioned that I don't think you would know about if you're not in Chicago is the way that students move from school to school can have an impact on how much danger they face on the way to school. So when you close a school, it's not just a function of saying, we're going to close this school and we're going to move you over to this other one without any type of trouble. Uh, Can you talk just maybe a little bit about what's unique about Chicago when you just shut down this school and you try and move kids to an entirely different one? I, I can do that. I can give you a very real example of that because we had a student, I'll never forget, we had a student um, at Diet who did not live in the neighborhood, right? He lived maybe six or seven blocks north of where the school actually was. So Diet is on 51st and King Drive in Chicago, and he lived in the 30s. So like, just, I'm not going to give his address, but he lived somewhere around the 30s, right, in King Drive. Two completely different gang territories. Um, And so the challenge became, right, how do you build relationships with students to make sure that the gang territories and boundaries that exist outside of your school don't find themselves into your school? Because the very harsh reality is that if students live in different neighborhoods, there are implications to that. And they may not be gang affiliated, but they live in a different neighborhood and there are very real territorial boundaries around which gangs 
um, live in certain areas. And so I'm, I'm very, I'm very proud to say that we were actually able to build enough. We were able to build strong enough relationships with kids where I just told them, I understand the realities of, of Chicago, but when you walk into this building, we're this is a neutral space where everybody can come and exist, right, and be okay. That takes building relationships with students because the reality is, in real life in Chicago, when you move from space to space. Black boys in particular have to be extremely cognizant of where they are and how they move, even if they're not gang affiliated because gangs exist here. That's just the reality. So when you move um, kids, you create different patterns about how they move uh, from school to school. And those patterns make them cross lines in a very segregated city. First of all, Chicago, like like New York in some ways, I've never seen a more color-coded um, city than, than Chicago. But can you talk a little bit about how opportunity in the Chicago public schools is distributed? Because you might have a diet, and not far from a diet, you might have a school that has a totally different reality, not far at all, like really close by, has a totally different maybe student body or level of resources, or I don't know what you would call it. Can you talk a little bit about how opportunity distributed in the Chicago public schools? Yeah, I will talk about historically how it's been distributed and how, you know, recently in the past few years, the current CEO has really made a concerted effort to disrupt the patterns of how things has, have been historically distributed. We have a, a funding system here um, called student-based budgeting. And that means the dollars follow the students. So your funding is directly tied to enrollment patterns. So in spaces where you have a lot of students, which typically tends to be north side selective enrollment, um, there are a lot of funds that travel with those particular students. Um, in spaces where you have smaller schools, which tend to be neighborhood schools, you have fewer dollars, because everybody's kind of competing, right, to get into those. It's, it's a very capitalistic way, to be quite honest, of looking at education. You have people competing to get in, in a small number of schools. So what are the implications of that? What that means is if I have a school where my enrollment is, is very high, I can provide more arts programming. I can provide more enrichment activities. I can provide... Um, extra programming. I could provide more social emotional support because the reality is I have more funds to go around. If my enrollment is low, I'm I'm trying to figure out as a as a principal how to fund teachers. And if I'm a good principal, I'm trying to make sure I'm balancing my staff so that I have veteran teachers, middle of the road teachers, and new teachers. I don't want to have all new teachers because you know you need people with experience. I don't want to have all veteran teachers because you need people who, who are kind of fresh out of schools because they have fresh ideas and they can innovate. So that puts me in a catch-22, right, if I have limited re or finite resources. So what ends up happening is that sometimes smaller schools end up in kind of like a, a cycle of how can I say, whereas it's kind of like a, a, a um, I don't even know how to explain it. I'm, I'm trying to get students, I don't have students and I don't have the programming to attract parents to enroll students, right? And so then it becomes like this, this, this never ending cycle is how I'll describe it of trying to get resources, I don't have the resources, I can't provide quality programming, and so my enrollment continues to dwindle, right? So that's how it has historically been, honestly, um, for several years in Chicago. Now, I will say the current administration, um, Dr. Janice Jackson and Latanya McDade have really taken a lot of steps to remedy that by providing smaller schools with financial support to kind of provide that buffer. Also, the state of Illinois passed an evidence-based funding model which actually is designed to kind of remedy that because we know that if funding is not, you know, equitable, you are perpetuating the vicious cycle, right? 
Mm-hmm. Um, but if you want to have, historically, historically, that's how it's been. I do see a shift in that where the pendulum is sort of swinging the other way. I think right now we have a unique opportunity um, with with George Floyd and all of the protests that are happening. I think equity is again at the forefront of folks' minds. So I have I have confidence that people are pushing for legislation to remedy that. There are some really good principles here. My former colleagues, particularly at the high school level, who are on the front lines every day really, really trying to advocate for black and brown kids in the city of Chicago. And they do it for, they do it vigorously and with all of their might. So it's not perfect, but we're fighting to make it better. I'll say it that way. So in all of this, one of my rubs with uh, Journey for Justice had been, and I think a little bit continues to be their campaign about We Choose. They have a campaign called We Choose. And their take on choice is that um, is that we shouldn't have choices except for district schools, except for neighborhood community schools. So it's kind of, to me, uh, disingenuous a little bit. It's the opposite of choice. It's we should be narrowed down to just having neighborhood schools instead of charters and these other schools. What's unique to Chicago that creates this animus about charter schools? Thank you for asking that question. And I know we talked about this in our our previous conversation because I'm really big on context, right? I think when you when you talk about the push for uh, the push against, you know, charters or whatever, you have to understand where that comes from and people, the reason that people fight for that. If you look at Chicago in particular, because context is important. When you talk about the school closings that happened here a few years ago, if you look at the map, and and there have been studies and research done about this, the majority of school closings happened on the south and west sides of Chicago, which primarily serves black and brown students, really black students, to be quite honest. And that was all kind of embedded in in this language around, in this discourse, and we could do a discourse analysis of choice and how language is used, right? Like people need to have the option. They need to be able to choose, which I actually agree with. I think parents should be able to send their students wherever they want to send them. Let me just say that. However, let me put a let me put a comma there. <laughs> semicolon. A semicolon. That's what it would be. I taught English, so that's important to me. A semicolon. <laughs> However, comma, uh, if that is done at the expense of giving parents the option to have quality schools two blocks away, then that actually becomes disingenuous and that actually is not, you know, providing choice. So what was happening was schools were being closed, 50 plus schools were being closed in Chicago, but then you had a lot of charter schools that actually began to emerge and spring up. Renaissance 2010, and this is an interesting fact that most people don't know, Renaissance 2010, I actually had a proposal for a high school um, that made it to like the final stages called Inglewood uh, High School of Media Arts and Sciences. And I was denied, even though the community actually wanted the school because there was a school, there was a network of schools called Noble Street, right? Um, A network of charters that actually got the, they got the bid for the school. So when when you hear the G2 Browns and the the uh, Journey for Justice folks talk about you know you know being about choice, it comes from a space of hey in Chicago specifically, if you disinvest in neighborhood schools and you transfer those funds to other spaces, is it really about choice, right? Because if we're really talking about choice, then like Chicago, like in the suburbs of Chicago, if you live in a suburb, if you live in Evanston, if you live in home of Flossmoor, if you live in any of those suburbs, there's typically one high school that every student attends. And so all of the resources are poured into that one particular high school. So that's the context. And I know people fall all across the gamut on where what they believe about school choice. I gave you mine. Like you should be able to send your students wherever as long as everybody has, as long as equity is at the center of it. I have no problem with it. Um, but that's where that comes from. 
So how do you get into charter schools in Chicago? It's typically um, similar to, it's a lottery, right? So you apply and some schools have different criteria that they apply. Like you may, you may have to have certain test scores or whatever, but there's a universal application process. Uh, parents and students fill out the application online through a process called Go CPS. A lottery is is randomly um, um, implemented, and you have a number. And depending on what your number is, you have a seat or you don't have a seat. And so, if you don't have, like, if you are not able to get into that particular school, then you default to your neighborhood school. If you haven't had another, if you didn't apply for another school. You know, one of the reasons that I asked that question is because JITU often says the reason that they do the We Choose campaign and that they're kind of anti-charter is because they believe that charter schools choose their students rather than people choosing the school. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I would ask you, number one, do you, do you stand by that as an accurate statement of how charter schools enroll kids if they actually choose the students? And the second part of my question is, I've never understood when people make this claim about charter schools that they allow the continuation of schools in your city that admit kids into a traditional public school on the basis of test scores, right? Like that to me says you're literally choosing your students and you're literally cherry picking your students um, and you guys have, I think, a more robust system of these schools like Walton, Walter Payton and others, where I read something like as a person who's not in Chicago, read something I just couldn't believe, which was that you get kicked out if they just if they figure out that you got in with the wrong kind of address or whatever. But if you're white from the suburbs and they find you, they just let you pay tuition. Right. To go to a public school. Um, I had never heard of that anywhere else before. Um, cases where they actually found people defrauding the system to come into the city to go to the school. It must be a very, um, I don't, a very uh, attractive or desirable uh, education you get there because apparently there's people lying to get in from other places and they were busted and it was something like 14K or 16K they had to pay and they were allowed to stay and finish their time there. So anyways, that's a long-winded way of asking the question around, why is the heat around we choose and, and the selectiveness of charter schools and leaving open this other thing, like where I live, there would never be a public school that admits people on the basis of their test scores. That's just not done here. So for me, it's a little weird. Yeah. Um, I mean, Chicago is unique in that way. I, I, so yes. I mean, that is that is a very real system here. Depending on your test scores, it can very much determine the schools that you end up um, enrolling in, which is why diet pivoting a little bit was so important because the whole concept of diet high school for the arts was that I wanted to prove to folks that you could have a high quality school in a neighborhood where students did not have to have a specific test score to get in. Right. It was it, it was it was designed to disrupt this narrative of right. You have to you have to go to a Peyton or you have to go to a Northside College Prep, and if you don't, then you're not at a quote unquote good school, right? Because there 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 are two there are two lines of thinking that to me and that need to be disrupted. And I have very good principal friends who are principals of very high quality neighborhood high schools. But because we have this thought process that if we don't get into selective enrollment schools, we're not getting a good education. Then it becomes self it becomes self fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. So two things need to happen. Number one is we have to, and this is what diet was designed to do, and a few, and a few other schools in the city um, where I know very good principals are fighting this fight of neighborhood schools and, and just getting people to believe that neighborhood schools can be quality schools. We have to invest, and this is, I think this was kind of like Journey for Justice and G2's point. We have to invest in neighborhood schools. If we invest in neighborhood schools and provide high quality experiences for students, there will be no need for a selective enrollment school. There will be no need for testing to get in. We can disrupt that.
right? Because that creates, I'm just going to be blunt, that creates equitable circumstances just off the top. I, I, I'm not mincing my words about that. Anytime you start admitting students based on test scores, it gets really, it gets complicated. <laughs> it gets complicated, right? And so there's providing resources to neighborhood schools so that we can provide high quality experiences. I will give you very, very tangible examples. At, at Diet, we had a virtual lab, right? Where students could take virtual field trips with Google 3D glasses. And we got that as a result of partnership with an organization called 1871 that really walked into the building and could not believe it, was a, it wasn't a selective enrollment school. They were like, wait, this is not selective enrollment? And everybody who came into the space was like, this is not selective enrollment, this is a regular school? Yes, this is a regular school <laughs> with, with kids who may have 1,600 on the SAT and they may have 900, right? We didn't matter to me, we educate the kids we get. So we have to invest there. And then the second half of that is if we're really decolonizing our thinking about education, we have to stop believing that because something is on a specific side of town, it's better. We have to stop believing as black folks that because it's on the north side, it's better. Because it's a north side college prep, because it's a Walter Payton, it's better, right? We have to believe in us enough to say, if there's a good principal in this building who's fighting for kids, who's gonna do the right thing, I'm not gonna send my kid 20 miles away or 15 or five or six miles away when there's a school right here, two blocks away from me, right? That my student can walk to, that my child can walk to. So yes, I mean, I think test scores, using test scores as a litmus test for entry provides challenges. I'm, I mean, I, I think that's, it, it does, right? I'm not gonna, I'm not going to lie about it. It provides challenges, and it's, it's, if we're really talking about equity, it does provide some challenges in that way. And there are people fighting that fight. Um, but I think until parents get comfortable enough saying, you know, hey, if there's a good neighborhood high school and I'm going to send my students to that neighborhood high school, we end up, we end up perpetuating that cycle. Do you uh, think that you have a yeah? Do you have enough examples in Chicago of elementary schools that are neighborhood schools that are doing that well? Doing that well on the south side of Chicago, elementary schools, neighborhood schools, no special program, no, um, not a charter, but are doing well enough to be held up as the example. I think we have a critical mass that has to be highlighted more. I think one of the reasons I took this job um, as an ED of new leaders was was that I figured out, you know, I can keep trying to transform schools or I can start to try to develop people who will then become the transformers. And if you're talking about the multiplication factor, it's, it's easier to develop people who can do the work than me, my continuing to try to move from school to school because diet was the second school that I was actually a principal of. The first one was Michelle Clark, um, same same sort of situation and circumstance on the west side of Chicago, was in disarray, uh, was on probation, and then that ended up becoming one of Chicago's first five early college STEM high schools in the city, uh, one of which was actually recognized by President Obama, again, Kids on the west, black kids on, on the west side of Chicago, right? Like proving that shattering the stereotypes and the narrative about black kids, but also shattering the stereotype about, you know, you have to go to charter, you have to go to private, you have to go to selective enrollment. This really, this work can really be done um, if we just really make a concerted effort to number one, provide the necessary resources, and then two, have really good leadership right, in those spaces, because we don't talk enough about the role of principals in high schools. Principals hold it all together. They give people vision, they define the vision, and they get everybody mobilized and galvanized around that particular vision. So I, I do think in Chicago, there's a critical mass of really good schools. I think, I will say this, I also have an MBA, um, so marketing was also extremely important to me. 
I think those good schools have to begin to market more explicitly and clearly the work that they're doing. And that's not intuitive for educators to think about marketing, like how do I market my school? That's not a skill set. That's not something we think about. Um, but if we don't control the narrative, then the narrative becomes all schools are bad. So we, we have to control the narrative. So I want to take a look here. Um, cause the reason I ask about the schools, if there's enough that are an example, I think the way that districts and educators tend to talk about schools is different than what parents want. And I know myself, like, I don't know how the lines in Chicago actually work, but I always hear South side, which makes me think that there's a North side and there's a West side, there's some other sides and that some of those other sides have more money, um, that that are better resource, more money. So what middle-class people often do can tell you a lot about a city, like where they tend to gravitate towards and congregate. Um, and generally they congregate in schools where there's more kids like themselves, you know, um, and where they see more resources, they have newer, um, they might walk through and see a swimming pool or they might walk through and see a better science lab and okay, this is a good place for me to put my kid. And then what you see in hood schools is you see people like stringing things together, right? And the people in those schools who are all very hardworking people and very committed and love the kids as much as anybody else, have to make this really kind of wild pitch, which is, but I know it doesn't look great, but you still should choose this because there's really good things going on here. And I don't envy anybody who's in that position because middle-class people right. are shrewd shoppers, right? I'm a shrewd shopper, I'm middle-class. So <laughs> let me just put this out there. I've got kids who I love too much to be playing around with school districts. And I'm not looking for a good story. I'm looking for performance because we are in a race to get our kids to compete with people that have had a 400 year head start. So we don't have any time to be playing around with, you know, um, with good stories. We need to be playing around with anything that's gonna get our kids to compete in the world with folks that have had a head start on our kids, like a big head start. And they continue to continue their head start because they're shrewd buyers when it comes to schools. They don't just go putting their kids in just anybody's school. They avoid some schools like the plague. So when I'm looking here, what I have up on the screen, I pulled up diet, um, um, the the uh, academic stuff from the, the state of Illinois report card for diet. Yep. And this isn't to talk about diet so much. It's just to talk about all these other schools because there's a scatter plot here that kind of shows you how black students are doing specifically. I had another one that was low income, but you know, yeah. like the, the scatter plot, the fewer the black kids, the better in a school, they're, the better they're performing. So this is like Northside College Preparatory High School. I don't know what that is, but they only have 8% black kids. But boy, that 8% that are damn good. near 100%, right? Well, um, and a it's a that's selective a enrollment. Yes, that's an yes. example of what I was talking about, yep. So what about Brooks uh, College Prep? Selective enrollment. Selective enrollment, because they're like 80% black and um, like 69% um, proficient. So that's pretty high. They're like an outlier out here doing really well. Now, this is black, but let's just put it back to low income because um, I, I, it looked pretty interesting to me. So this is the low income scatter plot. Um, now, these schools out here that I would say are outliers that are um, highly proficient, and high with low income students, like a lot of them, like Hancock College Prep. So they are 82% um, low income and 61% proficient in grade 11. Um, on the, This is the SAT too, by the way, I should say. Um, yeah. But these are all, these. when I look on the names of things, they're all such and such college preps which leads me to believe that they're all a special school of some sort. Um, so the high, the, the schools in Chicago appears to me, and correct me about this, that appear to be really high in, um, in poverty and also really high in proficiency seem to be parents choosing these schools that are either charters or special schools in one shape, one shape or form or another. And they're still low income, but parents are making a choice to pick the better ones. If I'm a parent, I'm looking at these schools down here, like Hirsch Metropolitan High School, um, 
which has almost zero proficiency and 99% kids of color, uh, or 90, I'm sorry, 99% low income, what's my kind of impetus to choose the schools that are in this lower, you know, kind of performing area? The School of Social Justice High School, 95% mm -hmm. low income, 3% proficient. Mm -hmm. What's my, what's my, how do you sell that school? Um, to get parents to choose those schools because these are in their neighborhood, but they're not choosing them. Yeah, that's a great question. So now you're going to get into my philosophy about, you know, standardized testing, which I think. Oh, don't do it to me. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a whole agenda of that. We can talk about that. Don't um, do it and, to and me. Just, the self, I mean, I think it's self fulfilling prophecy, on, and it, but that's a different show, right? How do you how do you sell those schools? I think diet is the model. And I'll say it because diet started with a freshman class, uh, neighborhood school, but diet was fully invested in. I think the district spent about fourteen million dollars to to kind of before its opening to renovate diet to make sure the space was conducive to learning, right? So I think when you're talking about trying sell something that's broken that's very difficult i didn't have as much of a problem marketing diet because I'm building it from the ground up and i got to paint a picture for parents about the possibility right and so i think if you're the principal of a neighborhood high school you have you have you have three very distinct jobs number one is to make sure you advocate resources for your your students which I was a vociferous advocate for resources for my students. We had all types of partnerships. Uh, we had a partnership with Bright Star Community Outreach where students had the social emotional support that they needed. We had a partnership with 1871. We had people like uh, Brandon Bro, who was Chance the Rapper's artist coming through GLC. So I had like people, John Legend did a drop for the school. So as a principal, you have a responsibility to develop the relationships you need to provide resources to your students. That's number one. Number two is good leaders paint pictures. They, they get people to believe in what they cannot see. And that, that is not something that I'm sure you can teach like in a class. But as a leader, you have to paint a picture of, of you have to make people believe what they can't see. Nobody would have believed that on the south side of Chicago in Washington Park, that we could have had a level one neighborhood high school with black kids, which is the second highest rating in the city of Chicago. That was okay, diet, so right? Help, help me understand this though, because this is 2019. Yep. And in 2019, right. this is saying that diet students, that 9% of them either met proficiency or exceeded proficiency. So 7% yep. met proficiency, 2% exceeds right. proficiency, 52%, um, the majority were partially meets and 39. Yeah. I hate when, I hate when states and, and people do this like partially meets and approaching because parents aren't, don't know what, what to make of partially meets and approaching. Um, it's like being kind of pregnant. Either you can read or you can't, right? Like it's, it's you know, this this ain't this ain't working for me. This, you know, partially meets, you're not partially pregnant. You either pregnant or you not. Um but I mean, I mean, listen, I want to be sympathetic here, but I want to say this is what gets me about community activists and community partnerships and community schools, and we we have a lot of good stuff going on. You can have all the good stuff going on in the world. But yeah. these type of numbers are predicting for kids that they're not going to make it into the workforce. Not a, right. They're not going to find a good place in the workforce. The, 9% of them will. 9% of them probably can do something post-secondary, mm -hmm. like afterwards. Yeah. But in a city like Chicago, especially, where I don't know what the... the is, let me just back up. Chicago is an expensive city. So um, you, there's two different lifestyles in Chicago that I've seen. Um, there's the Chicago lifestyle that gets sold to us from a distance. Like when we come through the airport and we get an Uber and we go to a meeting and then we get back and Uber, go to the airport, we see one Chicago that way. Right. Yeah. But there's kids in Chicago who will never live the fabulous Chicago lifestyle, uh, that it takes there because it's so expensive and it requires a good job. 
which probably requires college, which probably requires that you get in high school a leg up, like you're doing, you're, you're doing really well in high school. And some of the schools like Jitu and others that are fighting are actually getting better numbers than this with the same kids in a lot mm -hmm. of cases. Now, I know yeah. you mentioned about like standardized testing. So the rub on standardized testing is folks will say it's not fair. It's not fair, maybe. Like, I don't know if it's fair or not. It is predictive, though, in a lot of ways of what's going to happen to you in life, right? Um, no, I'm going to push back. Okay. You I'm are? Push okay. Back. Do it. I'm going to push back. All I'm right. going to push with research from the University of Chicago consortium that says the greatest predictor of college success is not standardized test scores. The greatest predictor, and you'll you'll see this shift in CPS. We we CPS has been honestly on the cutting edge of resource uh, research around freshmen on track and those indicators as well. The greatest predictor of college and university success is a student's GPA. It's not a student's test scores. And I would even argue that the reason that you're seeing a shift away from using test scores as the litmus test for college entry is that universities are figuring that out. So you'll see universities like University of Chicago is moving away from using that as a litmus test. And that's, that's, a, that's a prestigious <laughs> university, right? So if they're moving away from standardized test scores as, as a litmus test for entry, I think we should be paying attention. But the research shows that students, particularly from Chicago, who were retained past the first year, right, of college in Chicago, they left and they went to a university, they had a GPA of 3.0 or better. So if you really want to talk about decolonizing the system of education, once a student gets to high school, if they're quote unquote, and this is deficit language that I don't use, but I know is what people understand. If they are behind, right? You're, you're, the reality of the situation is if a student comes into ninth grade, reading at a seventh grade level, by the time they get to junior year, you as a principal may have ensured that that student has all the growth in the world, that they have no longer are reading at the seventh grade level. That's not going to show up in a standardized test score. And that is the very thing that people use to continue to disinvest in neighborhood high schools. So again, it becomes a cycle of creating a narrative of why we need to disinvest in neighborhood high schools and why we need to make sure these dollars are going somewhere else, right? So now I'm going to push back on you a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. Okay, so first of all, this is what you're talking about. The study finds that, um, oh, I don't know where I went. Um, the study there found that um, um, GPA is five times more predictive than standardized tests, the ACT specifically, um, right. which I think is powerful, but I have a couple of questions. So the first one is this research was done on um, students in Chicago between 2006 and 2009 who um, immediately went to college. Right. So if you study only the kids that got out of high school and made it to college, you already have a bias sample. You're not talking about all the invisible kids of Chicago that don't go to college after high school. So you're already talking with a, a bias sample of kids in this research that says their GPA was more predictive. Of course it was because you're, you're working with a selective group of kids, kids who actually make it to college, right? So that actually, obviously their GPAs are gonna be um, very strong. But my question around this is, when I see something like we were looking at those numbers, the test scores, are you telling me that you would have a school that had mostly all kids that weren't testing proficient, but had high GPAs in those same schools? Like they'd have great GPAs, but just on the tests themselves, um, the test isn't predictive because their G GPAs were better than the tests were. And I would want to know how that works out. Like how you have a school where kids have great GPAs, but just not, not able to demonstrate it on the tests that are meant for them to demonstrate it on. Yeah, I don't think there's always alignment between standards and assessment. I mean, when this is getting into the weeds of education, right? So you, I'm kind of a geek and a nerd when it comes to this kind of stuff. I don't, I, I think we have a set of standards that we've been given. In Illinois, we use Common Core. I know not everybody does, 
And then we have we have companies that make a determination about what they think, how they translate those standards in terms of an assessment. And if you were to ask me if I think those companies that get a lot of money always perfectly align standards with assessments, I would say no. I don't think there's always that linear. <laughs> I don't think there's always that linear relationship. I would also say that when we look at the nature of grading, right, because you talk about GPAs, this gets into, you know, are we talking about standards based grading, which is what um, I had as a principal, where we ensure mm -hmm. that students were able to achieve mastery of specific skills, as opposed to just doing school well, right? There are a lot of students who just do school well. They come to school, they're compliant, they're quiet, and they don't say much. And in some cases, that translates into a 4.0 GPA. It has nothing to do with whether or not we understand where they can, whether or not they can solve a two-step equation. You get what I'm saying? So if grading can be all over the board. So if you ask me about diet in particular, we had a standards-based grading system where teachers and I decided based on the standard, okay, what is the scope and sequence? How do we determine where students need to be at the end of freshman year? How do they demonstrate whether or not they are at that particular place at the end of freshman year? And if they can demonstrate that, then they mastered that skill. And they could easily have a 3.0 GPA, 3.4, 3.5, right? They could have that GPA, but if you ask me how it, how it happens, I don't always think standard, standardized tests are aligned to the standard itself. In addition, standardized tests are timed. There, there are different skills that are being tested. They're timed. They have to take them in a specific setting. So when you add those sorts of things, a student may be able to solve a two-step equation in a specific amount of time, and then it may take some students longer. But now if you add the constraint of time, you change the dynamic of whether or not you're testing my ability to solve a two-step equation. So I think we have to be, the, like I said, this is a whole different show. My, my, my ideas about standardized testing and the alignment from K-12, because I think there's misalignment there. I think the standardized tests that happen at high school don't align with the standardized tests that happen in elementary school. So that misalignment throws things off as well. And I'm not even making excuses because I used to always tell my teachers, hey, listen, we know that this test is testing a variety of things other than a student's actual intelligence level. But the reality is it's the limit test we have. So we have to prepare students to take this effectively and efficiently to the best of our ability. Right. So we have to play this game. So I'm not saying that they, they don't need to do well on tests. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that if we're really going to get to the root of disrupting inequity in K-12, we have to become more analytical about the systems that are put in place to actually <laughs> provide a, some sort of litmus test or become separators for our students. And that makes sense. <laughs> I mean, in a way it does, but this is where this is where I think the parent, the parent and educators might separate a little bit in that. As parents who work in the real world, we know that we're yep. not going to we're not going to be afforded the the luxury of excuses yep. of why we can't do what white people do, right? Yep. So anywhere where we work, I, I'm sure you have heard it your whole life. You're going to work twice as hard. You're going to have to yeah. um to get to get half as much. You're going to have to work twice as hard. Or you know these are the things I call the Negro proverbs. You know like. Don't quit one job till you have another. You know, that stuff we were all trained. Once you have an education, no one can take it away from you. You know, all those things. Right. Um, so that, those things are Negro proverbs that are, they're proverbs because they're absolutely true. They're, they're what we know. So even if, the, let's say the tests were as unfair as all get out. Let's say they were the mm -hmm. most racist tests in the whole world and white people are passing them and it's part of a gate to the middle class. Um, yeah. There's no level at which I think you won't hear people say this. People in PhD programs say that they're encountering kind of a system of 
not necessarily uh, <laughs> racial justice. Let's put it that way. You know, like so at all levels, become a PhD to get a master's degree in a lot of cases, to get into a college. Um, the tests and the gates may not always be fair, but they are there. So, yeah. um, so th those of us who pass through some of those gates are going to do better than the ones that don't. And I don't know that it helps us. This is something I think in education that we may argue about over over time, just internally. If you took everybody else out of the debate, it was just black folks arguing about this, um, whether or not um, whether or not our best play is to win in the system as it is, or to fight the system to be the system we want it to be. Like which one's faster at getting us towards justice, right? So these are the tests mm -hmm. that we have for right now. They are the gates, like whether we want it or not. This mm -hmm. So like when there were poll taxes in the South, for instance, or literacy tests, the vote. Um, yes, it was unfair, but we thought it was free so that they could vote, right? Like we did, we could have sat mm -hmm. around and said, this is so unjust. Like the, a poll tax, and nothing mm -hmm. is more obviously racist than a poll, or a, a, not a poll tax, the literacy test to vote. Nothing at the time could have been more racist than that. But the response from black people at that time was, well, I guess we better learn to read then, right? Yeah. I kind of feel like we're in a yeah. similar situation with standardized testing. Um, and, and this is the other thing about black middle class people. Do you think that black middle class people are going to be satisfied with a school where they, they don't think that their kid is going to come out the other end able to compete with white people? And I'm not saying that's a good, you know, it's a, it's a question. I'm not saying it's the right way of thinking or not. I'm just asking you straight up, real honestly, what do you think? That is such a loaded question. Wow, oh. there's so many layers to that question. There's, so, I love the question. I do because there are so many layers to it. Uh, <laughs> just using white people as the standard is the first problem. Um, <laughs> that's the first problem. Just using white people as the standard and saying this is what we need to be. Well, you don't think I'm, it's a competition a little bit? You don't think we're in a little bit of a racial contest? Mm -hmm. So here's the thing, full disclosure, I'm in a PhD program, right? So I have like a variety of lenses, which I, I kind of um, I kind of see. Uh, so I'm a critical race theorist. So I'll just put that out there um, in, in terms of my frame. But that's so interesting. I love this question. So a few things. One is, I don't think it's binary. I don't think, I don't think it's binary, right? I think you need people on all ends of this spectrum pushing and pulling, right? Yes, we definitely need to make sure students are prepared to play this game. 100% agree, right? That means we need people K-12 working. You can't just talk about high, once you get to the high school level, we have kids for four years and not even really four years because they're only in school nine months. So, uh -huh. <laughs> so the reality uh -huh. is if we don't start to look at this actually pre-K, because now the research is more around pre-K, we don't look at pre-k through 12 and look at systematically how we fix it and how we prepare students to play this game that we know we are forced to play as black people in, in society right because we have to play it um, i'm a mom so i'm i'm very clear about you know my daughter her sat scores are good but i made sure they were good and then that's being an educator <laughs> being an educator i just know she's facing so I agree with you. We have to prepare students, and I consider myself middle class. We have to prepare our children to be able to compete. So we need educators in the system working to do that. And that's why I was in CPS for 18 years, trying to make sure students had a certain level of proficiency. Even though I know the odds were stacked against me, right? I didn't care. I'm, I'm going to continue to fight like I can change the world. I just believe that. That's that's what I believe. You need people. I have some, again, really, really good principal friends um, who are, some of them are now chiefs of schools who are attempting to make sure students are fully prepared to play that game. Because while we know the reality of tests being biased and all of that, they have to master it. That's just the truth. So yes, I agree. But you also need people on the outside. You also need policymakers challenging the very essence of the bias that is inherent in those assessments. Like you need people saying, telling the truth that standardized tests 
test a variety of things that do not include a student's intelligence. So you need people on the outside okay, saying that so it's- let's stop there for a second. This, this will go to a whole different show. At, at some point, we have to have you back so we could talk about standardized tests and maybe a couple other people, because I think for, for the, the, um, the audience, like for the black community as a whole, this is a debate that hasn't been had that has brought more light than heat. Like we haven't had this debate. We have, we've heard a little bit about it, right? About the tests and what the tests do or whatnot. And I don't think we've unpacked for our own communities what what tests do, what they're for, um, right. how they're being used, like what the consequences of them are and all those things, what they predict. So I think we should have a conversation at some point that's super precise about assessment okay. and testing that tells people the difference, like an average parent in easy terms, the difference between a formative assessment and a summative assessment, the difference between tests that are used to drive instruction and tests that are meant for civil rights leaders and state officials to make sure that school districts are not having um, inequities in their outcomes, right? So tests do different things. Uh, when I hear people say, you know, like the achievement um, the achievement gap is really an opportunity gap. I think we should be more precise with our terms. There's something, a term of art, a thing called an achievement test. It's not an opportunity test. It's actually an achievement test. Like when you, uh, when you weigh babies for low birth weight or when you give somebody a blood pressure test, that's what it's called. It's called a blood pressure test, right? An achievement <laughs> test is a very specific animal. It does not measure IQ. It's not supposed to measure IQ, right. not an IQ test, right? Our community needs to know the difference in these things because we, and if, we, if we don't do that, we will have people who, um, who are organizers throw, mixing up the terms. And like, if it really was an IQ test, it's a really bad one. For instance, let's just put it that way. Right. If it was meant to measure IQ, it was really terrible at that. Um, and the other thing I think we should do for this to make things plain and simple for our populations is we should pull the tests up. Like the states post examples of their tests so that communities can look yeah. at them. And I think we should go through them together, like as people, educators, parents, everybody else, and say, let's walk through one of these. Because I think there's a lot of parents don't even know what the test is that their kids are taking. Like Listen, if you haven't been I in school recently, yeah, I used to, at, at the beginning of every year during the summer, I used to actually have my teachers take one of the tests, like take a, just one particular passage of an SAT and actually go through that process because adults do not understand, right, everything that's involved in that. And the fact that when you are in a time setting, and again, I'm let me let me be clear, I agree with you. We have to teach students how to play that game. I 100% agree. But I just think we need to be clear about what is measuring. I agree with you that different tests assess different things. Um, and it is an entirely different show, but this is like one of, one of my things, right? Uh, we, we, you, but at the bottom line is you need people on all ends of the spectrum battling to make sure this thing is equitable for black kids, black and brown kids. Well, I'm glad that you're doing it and you're uh, taking on a new life of doing it. Will you come back? If we want to have that I show, will. when you come back, okay? Because I, I want to have you back. I really appreciate you coming on today, first of all, and um, and you know, in our conversation prior to this, I walked away with a lot of light, uh, you know, about the situation that I talked about before. I like getting context. I think that's yeah. really important, yeah. like context of things. Uh, and you just gave me, even today, you gave all of our viewers more context. I can't say that it's completely changed my mind necessarily about um, about the advocacy of groups like unions and and J for J, yeah. but it definitely does yeah. give me a lot more context about diet specifically and the context of Chicago, like in which the, this school exists. And I don't think we do a good job. If we're gonna talk about schools in New York, we have to add New York context to it. If we're gonna talk about schools in Chicago or Beverly Hills or wherever it's at, we can't just talk about public education writ large, right? Uh, yeah. All schools and all learning is in the context. And I want, I just want to thank you for having me. Like, I think I want to thank you for even asking the tough questions, right? I, I never shy away from tough questions. I think, I think as parents, people need to ask questions. I like parents need to be asking questions. Parents need to hold educators accountable. And if an educator has integrity, 
he or she will not shy away from those questions. They will provide the context that is necessary, right? So thank you for even doing this because we need more people asking questions of educators, public officials, everybody. So thank you. I appreciate your having me on the show. Well, we're going to have you back to talk about testing and maybe a few other things. And I do think this relationship between parents and educators, specifically black parents and black educators, is a good route to go to generate the understanding we need to create agendas. Like we need agendas, we need better agendas in education. And I think it's going to come out from people on the outside and the inside having dialogue understanding each other. So thank you so much um, for folks watching and listening. As always, as I tell you guys every day, this is an amazing thing that people will actually spend their morning, spend an hour of their morning uh, on a weekday listening to and and making comments about public education. It's to me, it's an amazing thing um, that that we have so many people that are willing to give their time for it. So I appreciate everybody who does it. It makes my life better and makes me smarter each day, day by day. And during this pandemic, as we try and avoid getting the Rona, as I like stay shut in or whatnot, it's nice just to be able to have some, um, some contact with the outside world with other people who are also trying not to get the Rona. Um, so um, we're gonna win. We're gonna win with our kids and, um, and we're gonna have a better future and we're all gonna be the ones that make it happen and do it. So thank you for watching. Um, thank you to my guest today. If you have been looking uh, to see how you get in touch with Eula McLeod, I actually have done two things. I have put her Twitter handle uh, on the feed. You can see it going across the screen on the bottom there. Also have put her website into the comments so that you guys can find her website. It's a fabulous uh, website thank and big thing. Yeah, very nice. Thank very you. nice. Um, thank you for, for joining us today. And um, you guys all have a, a, a great rest of the week. Do your best to help these kids. Eight million black kids walking into schools every day that need our attention and need our help. So.